Hi, I'm Steve Simpson, Professor of Pulmonary and Critical Care at the University of Kansas, and Director of our Medical Intensive Care Units at the University of Kansas Hospital. And I'm Arup Pal, Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at KU and a hospitalist at the University of Kansas Hospital. We're here to talk about severe sepsis, life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to infection. By the end of this video, we want you to be able to treat severe sepsis when you recognize it. The steps are not difficult in principle. In fact, in our state of Kansas, some of our smallest hospitals do a great job in caring for septic patients, and our EMS providers are learning to initiate care in the field. So Arup, how do we treat severe sepsis? So after recognition of severe sepsis, we have some strong guidelines provided by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign to guide us. Yeah. So the first key is getting the necessary diagnostic information. That includes blood cultures and a lactic acid level to determine is severe sepsis present. And so wait a minute, the, so blood cultures and a lactic acid, how do they help save a life with sepsis? So blood cultures helps us identify if, if a specific bacteria is present. And then the lactic acid lets us know is there evidence of end organ dysfunction. And we'll talk a little bit more about other tests that are um, uh, able to give us that information. And so the blood culture should be taken when? Before giving antibiotics, and that gets us to <laughs> the next important. step. The next step is broad spectrum antibiotics because at that time you're not certain the specific bacteria. So broad spectrum antibiotics means we want to cover everything that we can across the waterfront. Here at the University of Kansas Hospital, a common regimen might be piperacillin, tazobactam, uh, levofloxacin, and vancomycin. Uh, we use the vancomycin because so many people in our community have methicillin-resistant staph aureus. But that's not true in every community. Correct, but it's important to start out broad spectrum because you want to get treatment started as quickly as possible and get on top of the uh, infection as soon as possible. The next step is fluids. Fluids, fluids, fluids is very important. 30 milliliters per kilogram has been shown to improve outcomes. Of you what want to kind get of fluid now? Like uh, lactated ringers, I think, right? Lactated ringers one. is preferred, um, and depending on the patient's situation, normal saline may be uh, of use, but lactated ringers has definitely been shown to improve outcomes overall. Some people choose to use albumin instead of crystalloids. There's not ever been shown to be an advantage to albumin, but one would use the equivalent amount of albumin solution for a liter of crystalloid. The key simple approach is treat infection, support the body, and that's the important thing in severe sepsis. The last thing is then reassessment. So at that point you want to see did your treatments uh, have the intended support and improvement in, it, in the patient's measures. Uh, so one would maybe want to check that lactate again. Exactly. Frequent recheck of the lactate to show improvement is critical to know if that patient is going to respond to your initial treatment. And it's important to be timely. We'd like to do that, those steps within three hours, and that's referred to the three-hour bundle. Uh, and so, as I understand it, the, the serum lactate dictates what happens in that three-hour bundle and who needs more fluids or who needs vasopressors or something like that? That, that is a critical piece gets a little bit more complicated than we have for this time for this video, but keeping it simple, fluids and antibiotics are critical to the management of patients with severe sepsis. Now there are some people who are sick enough that they actually need management in an intensive care unit, and they fall under what the Surviving Sepsis Campaign calls the six-hour bundle. Those are people who have a lactate that are, that's greater than four, or who have septic shock, meaning that their blood pressure doesn't respond to all this volume administration. They need to be taken to the ICU for vasopressor administration and hemodynamic monitoring, and we need to track their lactates to be sure that they're coming back down. Now, Roop, does all of this care have to happen in a hospital? Not all of the care needs to happen in the hospital, and as we've discussed, sepsis can happen anywhere. So these basic components of the recognition and management are things that we want to be able to do in the field, in the clinic, in the emergency room, so that we can give better care to our patients. We've learned that timing is very critical to the outcomes of our patients. Absolutely, and as a matter of fact, there are EMS units here in the state of Kansas that are able to give antibiotics and fluids to their patients in the field, on the way to the emergency room, so we get this treatment started sooner and sooner, which is crucial to survival. We have been able to demonstrate that the sooner we give fluids and the sooner we give antibiotics does equal better outcomes. Absolutely. 
That's all the time we have in this video. We've talked about the treatment of severe sepsis. Please join us for our next conversation when we talk about how to measure your performance and outcomes in identifying and treating severe sepsis. For the University of Kansas Hospital, I'm Steve Simpson with Root Powell, and we want to help you stop sepsis.